I'm from the Project Forum Civic uh, Association, together with Marta Shimichkova, Lucia Sherwood, uh, Lucia and um, Robo will uh, have prepared this event that will continue up to Monday evening. Before our moderator, Peter Mikulik, uh, presents uh, the panelists, let me present Peter. Pe Peter is the director of the Bratislava um, Book Festival, which is one of the most important uh, book festivals uh, in uh, this area. Uh, in in addition to being a fan of and uh, producing beautiful books, he is also keenly interested in what's going around him and us. Um, I would like to invite Peter to come to the podium and um, I'll hand over to him. Good evening. Thank you, Andrea, for having introduced me. In a while, I also would like to introduce the guests of this panel discussion, but before I do that, let me welcome all of you here who have come to this continuation of the um, Central European Forum, uh, at this uh, concert and party premises, which I consider to be a highly appropriate uh, venue for this um, event uh, and uh, this particular item is called Party of Love. It is not going to be a party in a traditional meaning of the word, but it will be a panel discussion of four prominent personalities uh, and they speak uh, about things surrounding or surrounding love. Love has been in the center of the discussion for obvious reasons. For one, uh, it refers to the 17th of November, which is a very important date for the uh, Central European Forum, because love was one of the slogans of the revolutionary upheavals. And love is something that increasingly appears as is um, something uh, which urges or incites political discourse as a response to fear, hatred, and other negative emotions that have taken a major part of the political space also in our countries. This is the territory and this is the theme around which we shall move tonight with my guests. At this moment, I would like to invite them to the podium and welcome them. They are Ms. Slavenka Drakulic, a prominent Croatian writer, essayist, a journalist who Slavenka Drakulic, welcome. Tomasz Serlacek, economist, a lecturer at the Prague University in Prague, author of the book Economy of the Good and Evil. Then we have Filip uh, Ternev, a historian from uh, the Vienna University, and also Max Harris, who has come here from the United Kingdom, even though he is initially from, the, from, from New Zealand. Before we give more information about our guests, of course, the basic information you could have found in uh, the brochure uh, published for the forum. Uh, but um, before we launch our discussion, I would like to ask Ms. Slavenka Drakulic, at the request of whom we are opening this panel discussion with a photograph that you see in front of you, and uh, it is overshadowing the um, dry leaf uh, heart, which uh, normally dominates the podium of our forum. But I would like to ask Slavenka to explain the reasons why she considered this picture to be important for the topic we are about to discuss. Everybody, um, you, of course, uh, may uh, as well ask why are we starting with this photo? Um, and why am I standing here with this stick like an old-fashioned teacher from the 19th century, which is how I feel now. But um, we are starting with this photo 
because we all think that we know what evil is and that we all know how evil looks. However, um, we have examples from history, from uh, uh, history from yesterday, so to say, and from today, not to mention art and movies, but an internet. But in order to illustrate what we are talking about, I thought it wouldn't be bad to, it would be actually useful to take another look, and I mean literally so. Um, I think it's very good, this concept, very old and very uh, ancient concept of, uh, of evil and good because it is uh, in all religions and it is actually the first set of rules how to, how to fight it. And interestingly enough, we didn't come up with any uh, better word so far. So if we turn to the photo, which is a little bit blurred, and this is why I took a stick to show you certain details, what do we see? We see a soldier kicking dead bodies. Um, this is a photo uh, from uh, American photographer, war photographer Ron Haviv. And uh, we cannot detect, you see that there are no insignia and there is no way we could say to what army do they belong, to what nationality they belong, or to what nationality the victims belong. But we know when this uh, photo was taken. This photo was taken on April 1st and 2nd, 1992, in the town of Bielina in Bosnia, on the border with Serbia. And uh, this photo, <coughs> the, on this photo, these uh, soldiers that you see, they're Serbian para paramilitary. There was Arkan tigers who were there on that day, and, and other paramilitary groups. And, uh, they were actually on, as you could see, on a killing spree uh, against uh, Muslim citizens. Muslim citizens who at that point were 52% of that small town. This later became known as ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing in the Bosnian War, in wars in former Yugoslavia, were very successful. Um, this one to the point in this region, to the point that the population Muslim population was reduced to 10% of before the war. I do not remember uh, where did I see that photo for the first time. Was it some foreign newspapers or was it maybe somebody pointed it out to me or so? But in, 19, in uh, 2003, my publisher, Croatian publisher from Feral Tribune, his name is Fred Raglucic, came to me with a suggestion that we should put that photo on my book, They Would Never Hurt a Fly. This is the book about, about war criminals. I was sitting in The Hague and uh, uh, looking at their trials and writing about that. So <clears throat> I agreed, of course, because I, this photo is for me very symbolic. But knowing that not many people will reach for the book with such a cover. Now, only in order to confirm that, later on in 15 translations the publishers of course all rejected uh, that photo for the cover and there i would say they were terribly appalled by that idea on the cover but uh, what i remember very well <clears throat> was the uh, no just to say one more thing and this is this photo was later on proclaimed to be among 100 most influential photos in the world. And uh, it's, to me it seems obvious, obvious why. So uh, when I, what I do remember very well, well from watching that photo for the first time was the feeling that I got. And the feeling that I got was sudden lack of air, as if I, um, as if I stopped breathing for a while, um, or as I forgot to breathe because of the shock that this photo brings to me. And the void was created in my chest, but also terrible dismay in my mind, because of course what you ask yourself is, how is it possible? And exactly that, that is the question that I deal with in this question about, in this book about war criminals. How is it possible? How do we do it to each other? <clears throat> So uh, when you see, when, when you see, when you look at these people, you, you will not see it, but 
I think you cannot see it because it's blurred. But here, you see blood. And you see that perhaps this blood is still fresh. Here, under this head, you also see blood. So <laughs> this is, when you see that, you, really, you realize that it has been done very recently, maybe a moment before. <laughs> um, maybe I got shocked because of this woman. Because this woman is lying here, an elderly lady, in a home knitted, hand knitted pullover. And uh, if you're not very careful, well, you see that her hands have folded above her head. And if you're not very careful, you will probably think that, I don't know, that she's hiding her face from the face of the guy who is killing her, the face of that. But actually, it is a hopeless try, <coughs> perhaps, to protect herself from what is coming. And what is coming, you can see on this next to her. There is a woman lying next to her. And what you cannot really see is that here above her ear, there is a, blo a blood coming from her head because there is a hole here. Her head has been cracked. Had been cracked and the ground underneath, probably because of that, is tinted with still fresh, uh, fresh blood. <clears throat> the asphalt under her is tinted with blood. So let's for the moment just forget this right part of the photo and turn to the left. Just let's look at the left. This left part of the photo seems almost separated from the right, the right part of the photo. And <coughs> it, uh, these two soldiers in paramilitary, they are passing by. They are not even looking at what is happening. They are looking somewhere else. They are looking ahead of them. They pay no comp uh, attention to what their companion is doing. So it could be as if there are two photos. If it wouldn't be for one small detail, and this is, you see, they are very near. They are passing actually close to the bodies because the guy, guy almost stumbled over the uh, uh, foot of the dead person. But they don't pay any attention. Why, do, why they don't pay any attention? Because they, as you can see from their looks, it seems to me that they are looking for other victims, for other civilians to kill. The cleaning of the town is not finished yet. It is in, in progress, so to say. They were killing for two days in Vienna. On the ICTY, it was said, that they killed in two days between 48 and 78 people. It's always very difficult to establish the right number. But actually, the suspicion is <coughs> that they killed uh, about 1,000. So why would these two guys pay any attention to dead bodies? The bodies are dead, so let's, let's go further. Let's do what we need to do. Forget about these dead bodies. <coughs> but. What I think it's very important to see here now is that the imbalance between their detachment, they're looking in a completely different direction, and his engagement is, forces us actually to pay attention <coughs> to this guy who is kicking the dead bodies, who is kicking the woman in the white pullover with his right boot. His gesture emanates various feelings, and they are not very difficult to guess. Um, even pupils in elementary school can read this photo and say what is on them. Why I mention pupils in elementary school is because Ron Haviv <coughs> decided to make a documentary about this photo to see how people read it, what they can see in that. And so he took it to the schools and without saying where it was and who are the people, nothing. And of course, the, the kids rightly tried to uh, ra rightly name the feelings that they see, uh, the aggression, the anger, the fury, contempt, and hatred that you can read from his, from only this, 
from only from this. Uh, but this is not all. This is not all. Um, you have to look very carefully, and I'm very much afraid you will not see it, but some of you who have a good eyes might see it. There is a key, there is a key in, uh, in the middle of it. Uh, there is a tiny detail that is actually the most telling of all, uh, I think, because this guy, while he is kicking these people, he is here holding a cigarette butt in his left hand. See here, this is a cigarette butt. So he's smoking and kicking these people. Why? Why is that important? This cigarette butt is, in my opinion, telling us a story. And the story to the viewers, to the viewers, is a background story of his behavior, so to say. It is telling us that the soldier, while smoking and walking, perhaps taking a break from killing, one cannot kill people all the time, one needs a little pause, no? Makes a detour in order to stop and kick these people on the ground. Evidently, during the break, because <laughs> evidently, even during the break, he cannot resist but stop and hit them and hold, hit the bodies. Although the job, his job in this situation is done. People are dead. What does he want more? Why he is doing it? We, what we can see here, and it's very important, is that he's making an additional effort. If this additional effort, he's performing to perform an act of extra violence. Uh, by, but why? Is it because for him the enemy is not dead? Or not dead enough? No, it is because it is not enough that the enemy <coughs> has, is, not, is dead, but it has to do something more to them. It has to humiliate them. They are no longer persons. He needs to kick a dead person as if he would normally be kicking a dead dog, perhaps, who bit him. And he's angry at the animal who bit him or, I don't know, <clears throat> did something, barked at him. Except that you do not kick people unless you believe that they are dogs. <clears throat> so what is happening on this photo is exactly that. This is what is happening. He is kicking them, and by that act of excessive violence, he is turning them into dogs, into garbage, into nothing. And that cigarette but in his, in his uh, hand, is betraying him. Uh, he is out, not only to kill, but to humiliate and to desecrate in his free time, making his behavior even more appalling. Is this the end of the story about this photo? No, because cigarette, cigarette that reveals even more something personal in his attitude towards these dead bodies. Um, that soldier behaves as if he knows the people he's kicking. And in the way he does, he knows them. They speak the same language. They live in the same country. He likes their food. He knows their habits and their way of being. Perhaps in his town, he went to school with some uh, Muslims. Some of them were his friends. In a way, they are so close to him that he cannot control his feelings in this situation. He cannot be indifferent. This fact make, makes him even more angry and violent because he doesn't control himself. Now, Hadith's photo is a picture of war. 
anymore, I believe. All ingredients are there. But also of a civil war, of people who live too close to each other, not to kill one another, one another with, without emotions. The soldier could have passed by like the other two, uh, but he did not. In, instead, he made a choice to express his uh, fury, maybe, who knows, even his own unconscious despair, by violating another big taboo, the one against a dead human beings. No doubt this is a picture of evil uh, as an act of collective identity, according to Zimbardo, or a picture of evil committed in certain circumstances, or a picture of a human nature, or a picture of human potential, which has both, consists of both, capability, cap capacity for both good and evil. And this is an illustration <clears throat> of what we are perhaps dealing with tonight and generally in our lives, and this is what we should somehow change. Maybe we will hear now how to change it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Slavenka Drakulic, for this electrifying uh, opening of our discussions. I can only agree with the final words that you have uttered that this meeting is also about trying to find the answer to the question that Slavenka Drakulic asked, mainly namely that how to change or how to work, uh, what to do about the policy of hatred and emotions that are brought into the political uh, acts and the life of the country by hatred and fear. I would like to offset this introduction by an appeal by, by inviting uh, the person I uh, consider to be a very optimistic regarding the possibilities of love or positive emotions and their transfer into politics. I would like to ask him to speak. His name is Max Harris, and he works with this notion both at home at, in New Zealand, but also during his studies at Oxford. This is a topic um, which um, is um, somehow also present in uh, Max's uh, text that you may read in the Slovak translation by Julia Sherwood. Max speaks very openly about the politics of love and about the need to uh, incorporate this emotion into the everyday including political practice. I would like to ask him uh, not an easy question to answer, what to do about it, how to go about it. Thank you, and um, thank you to the Central European Forum for having me here. Um, so as you said, I think we've just heard um, a really poignant account about how we can be driven to evil, and I'd like to just say a few words about how we might be moved towards love, in particular in politics. So. The anthropologist David Graeber says that the ultimate stake of politics is the struggle to establish what value is, the struggle to establish what is meaningful and valuable in life. And I share that view of politics and that view of the world. And out of that view of the world, I think we're led to something called a values-based politics, a politics that should be motivated by values that should embody values in how it's practiced, and that should follow through on values. But the question that arises, obviously, is what values? And to me, a value that we should talk more about, because of the problems of our time in particular, is love. 
But that raises another question which people have been wrestling with for centuries, which is what is love? And I don't know that I have the answer to that question, um, but two people that I think get close to an answer are James Baldwin, the American writer, and Iris Murdoch, the British writer. And James Baldwin says, love is a state of grace. And I think what's good about that quote is that it suggests that love is a kind of mood or a, a disposition. Iris Murdoch says that love is the extremely difficult realization that something other than oneself is real. And what's good about that, I think, is that it gets at this idea of love being about other people, being about looking outside of ourselves. So to me, love is nothing more than directing a deep sense of warmth towards another. And a politics of love is a politics that places that idea at its core. But as Slavinka said, you know, the politics that we have at the moment all around the world, while it's different in different places, is very far from love. I think our social relations are damaged, corroded by the excesses of capitalism. I think in lots of countries, colonialism and racism have also undercut the quality of relationships we have with one another. And as has come out prominently in the last few weeks, patriarchy and misogyny and sexism, I think, have also damaged how we relate to one another. So how do we get to love? I think to start with, we need to unwind some of the forces that are damaging the quality of our relationship, uh, the relationships we have with others. But beyond that, um, I think we need to ask, what, what would a politics of love look like in practice? And I've tried to write about um, what that might mean. And I understand that people will have different views of that. But to me, we might look, for example, to how Norway approaches criminal justice policy. I've spent a bit of time in, in Norway, in Norwegian prisons, seeing an approach that focuses on love towards an offender, care towards an offender, so that a person who commits wrong, and I don't mean to minimize the wrong that a person does when someone commits crime, so that person returns to society, not with a sense of hatred towards society, but with a willingness to be reintegrated. That's just one example. We could also talk about a sense of openness towards outsiders, towards refugees. We could talk about a less punitive approach to welfare. We could talk about self-care in campaigning and activism, since that is also a part of politics. And I could say more, if you like, about what it could look like. Now, I'm aware that there's a pull of cynicism when we talk in these optimistic terms. But I am given comfort by the fact that people have talked about love and politics for centuries. Uh, musicians and artists in particular, but also indigenous peoples, religious thinkers, and politicians and philosophers. And I think one of the great virtues of love as a value for our time is that it can be a unifying framework that brings together these different traditions. It can also be an antidote to the ruthless individualism the narcissism, the loneliness that I think characterize our time, the lovelessness that we see, for example, in this image. Now, there are a couple of possible reasons you might be skeptical, and I, I might just respond to those, and then I'll shut up and give other people a chance to speak. Don't we need that in politics, which is a messy business, and how does that square with love? Well, I think, actually, love is not inconsistent with anger and conflict. 
This is not, to be clear, a politics of being nice, even though it might seem that way. And to me, we can be motivated by love towards a necessary anger. Lastly, we might ask a question about whether love might submerge ourselves, whether love might lead us to losing ourselves. Uh, and I think this is a real danger, that love might flip towards hate, that there's an intensity in love that might somehow be dangerous. But I think we shouldn't resile from talking about emotion in politics, because I think even some of the traditional ideals of politics, like justice, are about emotion. The musician Nina Simone once said that freedom is just a feeling. And I think there's a lot in that idea. It's the feeling of no fear, she said. And a freedom, that classical dry political ideal, is just in part a feeling. I think we should also be open to the fact that other valuable ideals like love could in part be feelings too. So I know this might sound like an idealistic or kumbaya conception of politics but I would encourage us all to hold back on that cynicism and to sit with some idealism because I think the very best leaps of insight in human history have come from being willing to be idealistic, being willing to widen the window of what is acceptable in politics. And I think maybe bringing love back in might be part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max Harris, for his opening words. Thank you, Max Harris, for your opening words. Uh, what has uh, caught my attention in what you have uh, said and done is uh, the project, New Zealand project of yours. Uh, one of the reviewers called it a manifesto of, of a yet non-existent political party, manifesto of uh, a political force that uh, is uh, associated with some kind of expectations. I think that for Max, uh, it reflects the, his vision of the country that he comes from, but it is a very strong idea, and he is, uh, I'm sure, ready to elaborate on it and develop it further. Now I'd like to hand over to Mr. Ter from uh, the Vienna University, where he is um, teaching especially Central European themes and uh, such topics as migration and nationalism, because these are the uh, very hot, these are very hot uh, topics uh, associated with uh, highly strong human emotions. Uh, so I'd like to ask him to follow up on what Max has said regarding the police possibilities of love in the political discourse. In, in English, so that's our common language. Um, but anyway, thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here, especially thanks to um, Marta Simechkova. Um, well, what I would, as a historian, I have more dealt with evil, uh, sometimes with beauty in, in earlier works on cultural history, but mostly with evil, as long as I could stand it. Then sometimes also I switch topics. But today I don't want to tell about, you know, the history of evil or of killing or ethnic cleansing, what I did before, but I would like to engage with you um, and your, your thoughts. Um, I got a point in reading your text that it you know, love might be a good concept to, let's say, rejuvenate older concepts, which you know from political philosophy and political movements. So maybe indeed it's time to, you know, uh, give a new um, drive to liberal or democratic uh, fraternity, right? uh, or to leftist solidarity, to use older terms, or um, you know, the um, social Catholic teaching where you also have, you know, love sign next. Uh, that's also a very important element. So um, I would agree that, you know, um, older concepts like fraternity, solidarity, maybe, you know, the love sign next coming from this Christian moral teaching, um, in a way, are variations of love. But when I think about, you know, for example, this Christian concept, 
uh, then already, you know, I get a little bit cautious because who is who and what would be next? That's then one of the dilemmas there. I will leave that aside for now. Now, um, I have sympathies for your concept because it might help to fight the politics of hate and fear, which is a, a key element of ethnic nationalism and the present day neo-nationalism, which we all have all around in politics in Central Europe. Of course, also in Austria, last elections and future government. We will all learn how the message of fear and hate will be transmitted in daily politics. Um, and um, well, in my recent study of refugees and the perceptions of refugees, I could see also how full the social media are with hate. Um, you know, hate against migrants, hate against refugees, against foreigners, about the, against the elites, hate also against professors sometimes, and, you know, hate against so-called fake media. I mean, it's all around, right? So it's so dominant, and also because of that, I, you know, I listened to what you have to say, and, 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 um, and, and I think um, there's... You have a point because how could one counter those hate messages? Um, uh, it's very difficult to counter it with rational arguments. For example, if you take the, the discourse on refugees, okay, they're perceived in social media now, pertaining, you know, the social media where there's this anonymity, um, that the hate is even more prevalent than in than in face-to-face -face discourse. Um, and how are refugees viewed as a danger, as a, you know, uh, as they're going to cost something as a financial burden, as profiteers, um, as economic migrants, um, you know, and of course as aliens, right, and foreigners and, and uh, bearers of sicknesses. I mean, I could quote Kaczynski or other people. Um, now, how could one counter-argue? One can counter-argue with normative arguments, like the Geneva Convention, that there's some obligation to rescue, some obligation to help. One can counter, uh, find counter-arguments on a utilitarian level, that after all, usually refugees were to the benefit of receiving societies. That's my main argument in my recent book. Um, one can find demographic arguments about aging societies, you know, lack of... Um, 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 left, lack of, of work power, and so on. Um, but, you know, with all those rational arguments, it would be very difficult to fight these messages of hate. They usually prevail. They are much stronger. Also because you can, uh, you can convey them much quicker. It's so much easier to have a quick message of hate than to have a long rational argument. So maybe, you know... Um, to counter it with l arguments about love and variations of that is the right thing to do in social media, especially if we have then 140 fa characters like in Twitter, okay? And where you cannot build up long arguments. So then maybe, okay, let's take some variations like hospitality, solidarity. Uh, we could bring up emotional arguments um, and use love. Okay, fine. So maybe that's, you know, the simple message of hate might need a simple counter message of love in, in social media, in this sphere that, that might make uh, sense. Um, however, I also saw in a recent election campaign in Austria, not just Trump misused love, but also the Freedom Party did it. It had it on the campaign posters. Um, so, you know, uh, it can be used by very different people. But now, you know, I want to be a little bit more critical, however constructive, because that's also in your culture. Um, I think New Zealand is, is a very constructive culture, and uh, people are maybe nicer than over here, which is good. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, even, even in, if we take, um, you know, then... This course is about love, but also love how it, how it is conveyed. I think there are variations um, and grades of love. So, for example, if you juxtapose, let's say, the love, you, you know, the emotion you have to your own children 
compared, let's say, to the children of your sister or your brother, the nephews and the nieces, okay? There's already a variation. Then there's love from the parents, and, but also to the parents, again, would be very different. Love among siblings, then, of course, if it is about inheritance and money, it can quickly turn into hate, and you, know, you would have a strong competition that's known from childhood studies. So um, then you know, love would, again, work differently in small communities, in medium-sized groups, and in large-sized groups, like in nations, um, or whatever. You know, it's not on the personal level anymore. And, and then, I think, in ex inevitably, you come to mechanisms of in and exclusion. Now, you pertain to it pretty in, uh, briefly in your oral statement and also in your text, but I wonder, you know, um, isn't that a major hindrance? Um, so, um, and then if we need to acknowledge grades and shades of love, and you know, then maybe we can come to the very basic, you know, love sign next, okay? And then where and who and what is the next? Isn't that the, a major problem? And there, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, even if we distinguish, I made all this distinction in private love, but isn't there private versus public love, individual versus collective? Um, then there's a time scale. There can be eternal love engraved in our idea of, of, of marriage after all, right? But there can also be, it can also be time limited. Then there's space, you know, near, love sign next, or distant. Now you make the argument that, okay, one should love uh, the, you know, the distant person as much as the near person, but is that really possible? Um, and then how is the love communicated? Face to face, it makes a lot of difference to you know, being transmitted in the internet. Um, and I think that that's maybe one of the reasons why there is so much hate, right? Interpersonal or uh, anonymous. And so I'm not so sure, you know, maybe we need these old terms with which I started to differentiate love. So maybe we need still to talk more uh, specifically about uh, fraternity and solidarity and, and other, other, other roots of that. And then maybe it, a last word, which is more skeptical, but you quote in your text Havel, and okay, he, of course he talked about love. I'm, I'm an 89er, okay? <laughs> so I remember very well. Um, but okay, there was politics built on idealism, and, and wasn't that maybe also, you know, in a dialectical way um, connected with then, you know, the politics of cynicism, which we have seen since then. So didn't maybe the idealism in this politics breed the cynicism? Um, so uh, that's, that's my, 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 these are my questions. But anyway, thanks for, you know, bringing that to the discussion, your concept. Philip Ter, thank you very much, Philip, for your introduction. So what I heard you saying is these different ways of love styles, you have mentioned some of them, and they all have something in common, and that is the uh, the primary point of view we find in or aspect we find in another person and this is in conflict let's say with the concept of the traditional economy science which works with a model person with a homo economicus a person which deals with his or her practical objectives. And one of our guests, Mr. Tomasz Sedlacek, is a person who attacks this theory. And maybe I would use this opportunity to explain us his opinion on what we have heard so far. You may choose whether you are going to speak Czech or English. So we have here two excellent uh, interpreters, and uh, I am the older I get, the more I am converging to, to, to the radicality of love. I think it's the only way how to counter radical 
let's say, radical hatred is with ridiculously radical love. And we already have that. And let me, let me take the most radical symbols of love that we have. And I think that's Jesus Christ. I don't know that we have anybody who actually, because his version of love is, is radical to the point of uh, love your enemies and, and show the other cheek. It's, it's excessive. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's radical to the, with the negative even maybe connotation. It's so radical that today's Christians can't bear it. If you look into the debate with the refugee wave, you will have Christians accusing other Christians of them being too kind, too loving, too open, too stupid. And we have this in German, with, it's, it's called, in Czech it's called Pravdolaskaři. I don't know whether you have this insult here in Slovakia as well, but in Czech Republic it has become a very popular insult. Pravda is truth and Laska is love. So it's like in German they have this good mensch, a good man or a good person, uh, and it's become an insult. So let me, let me just very briefly start... For example, the whole structure of European Union is in a way a, a cynical structure because we've replaced the make love, not war, the basic fundamental genius idea of European Union is instead of love, we cross the love out and we put the word trade. Make trade, not war. That is, in one nutshell, the key principle of European Union, which worked. We've managed for the French not to hate the Germans. We've made love between nations, ironically, but we didn't manage to make love between neighborhoods. So Brussels today is a symbol of two things. It's a, symbols of, it's a symbol of European integration, and it's also a symbol of European disintegration when you think of Molenbrook, Molenbrook, and, the, um, Molenbrook and the other attacks. So what we have managed is to, is to swallow a camel, but we, we choked on a mosquito. We managed to swallow, to make peace between nations in Europe, but we did not manage to make peace between, between neighbors. So, so this, this reading of economic, it's, it's uh, this cynical, let's say, because European Union is often, uh, or, or we, sort of this liberal, democratic, um, open, let's say, loving rather than hating part of politics is very often accused of being idealistic. And um, the opposite of idealistic is realistic, which I thought was, this was never was supposed to have been allowed as with anybody. I mean, it's, there, there's two opinions. One is yellow and the other one is correct. You know, <laughs> one is idealistic and the other one is, is realistic. This is a complete imbalance in the naming itself. But the European, or the, the liberal, free, open, love, uh, underlining um, philosophy is based on trade. Now, here comes the brutal question, uh, and I really hope that we could, we could work on this together. Is love strong enough emotion to build European peace on it, or do we need trade as a graviton between nations? This is a serious question. Could we build... Peace among nations on love. Could we use maybe culture? Could we use different tasting food, as we've heard here? Could we use, could we use maybe um, um, art? Oh, did I already say art? Cultural exchange. And it seems that economics is an interesting, interesting um, area. You all know that I'm very, very critical towards the way we read economics today, but there are also positive sides to it, and one must not deny them. And one of them is, and I'm posing this as a question because, because here we have interesting thinkers, uh, that the heavy duty, that because in economics, the basic idea that uh, was expressed by Adam Smith was that um, pe pe people, we are so rich because we specialize, we trade with each other. But we can only trade with each other if we are different. So if we two would be exactly the same, there would be no trade of thoughts, of, of paintings, of, of smiles, of looks, and of goods and services, maybe also definitely not. So we are wealthy not because we are trading per se, we are wealthy because we are different. 
And economics, or trade, let's put it this way, trade is actively looking for different people. So if you are Chinese, let's say, or Australian, maybe even better, huh? from a completely different part of the world, you've never tasted beer, I've never tasted your fantastic red wine, and we meet and we exchange, I get wine from you and I give you beer, that's when we get what we call benefit from trade. If we two would be exactly the same, you, all, you could do exactly what I can do and you like exactly what I like, there is no trade. And my question is, do you see this in any other ideology? Do you see this in religion, an active seek of difference in order to make, be it a, a stupid trading link when I sell beer and he, he, he sells wine, it doesn't matter. It is a relationship. It's a trade relationship. It's not the most beautiful relationship, but it's, it's, it's a functional relationship. And people who trade with each other, you know, we have this saying, tell me what books you read and I'll tell you what sort of a person you are. No, tell me with whom you trade. Ideas, salt, or, or bureaucracy, and I'll tell you what sort of a person you are. People who trade with each other, this is also something that we say that people who live with each other for some time, they become like each other. Um, people who trade with each other also become like each other. This is what's happening in European Union. We're trading together, so also our administration, our bureaucracy, and even, believe it or not, our currency is the same, except in Czech Republic. Huh? Um, but so, so, so the idea, so the basic idea of European Union is to let's make, make, make trade in order to have peace. So the ultimate value is peace. Trade is what I would call a secondary value. It's like a um, special purpose vehicle, like a ladder. You don't use ladder for ladder's sake. You use ladder to reach somewhere. And once you've reached there, you no longer use the ladder, which is the famous conclusion of um, my favorite um, Wittgenstein uh, as a philosopher. So, so, so point number one. Point number two, there are different kinds of love, as you already pointed out, and I'm just going to, there, I mean, there is this love which is very strong and passionate, and that happens, like in physics, we have very strong nuclear bonds. It's a it's million times stronger than the gravitational force, but the disadvantage of strong and weak nuclear force is that it's very, very strong, uh, if you manage to crack it, you get atomic explosion. That's how atomic bombs are made. That's the energy. But they only reach for very small distance. Maybe like passionate, erotic, or um, uh, love between two people. It's exclusive. I don't want, or most people don't want anybody else. It's, it's like there is jealousy around, and that love is not to be shared. It's a sp and that love is valuable, like in economics, exactly because it's rare. You don't want to share it. But then there is weaker type of love. Uh, in, 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 in Christian thought, it has been called um, charitas. But you can also call it solidarity. Um, and that is a weak love. But like gravity, it r extends for millions and millions of kilometers. And I think we really, sh I mean, there is, of course, no hope in building love on, on, on that strong nuclear passionate love. But it's... Weak love. And now the question is, how big is your love? Now we're, of course, you know, we're, most of what we say, we are basically quoting songs. Huh? So <laughs> how big is your, how strong is your love? Is a question, um, in, in the beginning you love yourself as a child, and I'm quite sure we'll hear more, more of that. You don't even, you can't even imagine and looking at you, you don't even conceive that something could have the same level of consciousness like you. And then you extend your love to family, to your friends, and then maybe to, to a tribe. The Hebrew contribution to this was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which should also be read not negatively as we are used to hear, but you can also read this positively. In other words, if somebody pokes your eye, your eye does not have a higher value than your enemy's eye. The value of your eye is the same like his, which is a big one, because usually my eye is worth of your two eyes. If you poke my eye out, I want your both eyes poked out. This is one way how uh, many philosophers read this. It, it's in a way, you can read it as a positive sign, because it was common when somebody pokes your eye, you kill him or her. And then comes Christianity with even saying, love your enemies. 
Now, just to break this point home, let me explain to you the basic principles of Satanism. Because Satanism works with love actually as well. So if you read this Levee's Satanic Bible, they also have um, uh, sort of nine commandments in it. And the basic principle of Satanism is love the people that love you, hate the people that hate you. Do good to those who has a potential of doing good to you and hate those who have a potential or there is a danger from their side. This is not anything else but Laveic Satanism. And I want to say this because I want to contrast this with, 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 with this radicality. And that's actually quite natural. If you want to be a little bit mean, you could even say that the system under which we live today is much more closer to this understand or economic systems anyway. This homo economicus is exactly sort of try to, in, in every relationship that you have, increase your utility. And if the pain of somebody else increases your utility, then, then there is no reason uh, from an economic point of view for you not to do it. So that's my second point. Um, and I, I will also try to, try, to be, try to be brief here. Um, we are today confronted with professional cynics. Um, uh, cynicism has been mentioned a couple, of, a couple of times here. I'd like to add the word professional. These are people who are making their political lives based on cynicism, on deconstructing any values such as Trump. Trump, or our president uh, in, in Czech Republic, is, has been elected there as a symbol of hate. Our nation elected a bully. Stupid, stupid example is, I'm quite sure Donald Trump has given in his long life in his long, rich life, some money to charity. I mean, mistakes like this happen even for very clever people. Huh? But if he actually said, I give money to charity, this would not work. We don't want him to be nice, or Americans don't want these people to be nice. They've been elected to be evil. So maybe, or, or to symbolize this evil, to symbolize meanness. I mean, Trump can be as mean as possible, there is almost nothing he can do to lose his ironically fundamental Christian backing. I mean, this man has broken every one of them Ten Commandments, speaks like a pig, and yet his most strong electoral base are fundamental Christians who happen to be follow somebody called, called Christ, who would completely not approve of, of this sort of behavior. So... Uh, just to conclude the introduction, I, I think, yeah, exactly. I mean, this planet is transitioning from a local type zero planet to type one planet. We are now, according to theoretical physicists, which is, by the way, my most favorite political theory, comes from theoretical physicists called Carl Sagan and, 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 and others. And they believe that uh, civilization can be ranked according to the usage of energy, and I don't want to go into it, but Civilization type 1 can harvest the energy of the whole planet. Civilization type 2 can harvest their sun, their galaxy, etc., etc. We are civilization type 0. We cannot use all the energy that falls from the sun on Earth. We are only using 0.8776% of that. Which means that this planet in two or three generations will transition from a type 0, which is local, one against the other, to a planetary and that would then, that is a plan for, for us to have. When I was small, they taught me in philosophy that um, evil is the absence of goodness. I never really agreed with that. But when it comes to emotions, I think, I think so. I think evil emotions flourish in the situation of weakness of good emotions. And we need to, as philosophers, give our planet a positive outcome. This is where we're going. This is, this is the way we want to see the future. We want to make sure that the future is friendly to everybody. doesn't matter what sort of land you come from. And it is when we will be able to construct a positive philosophical outlook, because this to me, and this is my last sentence, the situation in which we live to me is a, a situation of post-modernity post -modernity lasting for too long. When I was young, when I was 20, I loved post-modernity and, and deconstruction because Everybody did, huh? <laughs> 20 years later, 
I'm thinking, well, may, I, I thought that we will deconstruct our old values in order to build new values for, for the planet that would be not based on hating somebody else. And I think we have failed in this. And that's why negative emotions have become the keystone of our politics. Tomáš Sedlaček povedal množstvo zaujímavých vecí. Tomáš Sedlaček has said a number of interesting things. I'll pick up two of them for the continuation of our discussion. You made an interesting appeal or asked a question right at the beginning whether we would be able to substitute the economics by love in order to create peace. Uh, what uh, was an interesting observation of yours was that economics creates relationship between the various actors. Here, I would like to to ask Slavenka to follow up on this question. Also, uh, in uh, the spirit of what she said at the beginning of this discussion. <laughs> I will go a little bit to that side in in my in my impressions. I um, uh, first of all, uh, I I belong to a hippie generation. Obviously, I'm the oldest here on the <laughs> and uh, maybe in the public too. So you perhaps still remember this song. Beatles song, all we are saying, let's give peace a chance. So, I mean, it's very nice that somebody actually is talking, giving you the freedom, giving you the 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 stage to discuss and to uh, discuss such uh, ideas and to actually fantasize, ending up maybe in science fiction, which is nothing wrong. I also love Carl Sagan. So, but uh, for me, uh, coming from where I come from, I have to say that. Um, I don't like the word love. I don't like it um, in maybe how you are using it dif is different for what I am used, how people use it. And therefore, love is, um, I think, used uh, uh, too much in, in the sense that I don't like it. I heard it so many times, and I heard it, I have to say, in a context, in a political context, but by demagogues, by people who tell you, for example, and this is <clears throat> what I was talking about earlier, what, what was before this picture was words, and the words were, love your homeland. So we are talking about nationalism. And what I'm afraid when we say love, I'm afraid that uh, love is in politics, evoking emotions that is used today in demagogical sense to evoke different emotions. And emotions evoked in that sense are usually nationalistic. So, love your homeland, or I don't know, immigrants go home. Uh, it's all exactly the same. So therefore, I have one question for Max. And this is, why are you using uh, uh, the word love and not, for example, goodness? And I tell you why, because I think what Philip said is much closer to, so to say, to reality, to in the sense that we should perhaps, I cannot, but maybe other people can, even on this theoretical level, I'm not speaking on theoretical level, obviously, but uh, the theoretical level of my colleagues, uh, um, cannot uh, take this radical idea of love. I would rather turn it into goodness precisely in the sense that Philip mentioned, and it is, let's be a little bit more kind, let's be a little bit more tolerant, let's be a little bit, show a little bit more solidarity. Although I think all of that comes at the disastrous moment, because if you go out and say such a things, I think you will be eaten up alive. So. But it's not important because we are not going to go out and be eaten uh, alive. We are going to preach that more than anything else. So no, for me, this is, um, this is a dangerous word because it evokes dangerous emotions. Of course, I, I say again, I'm speaking from my experience. I maybe cannot step out of myself, step out of my experience 
and therefore I do not uh, cannot support it. But in this uh, in this other let's say milder and more practical uh, form. So why love? Why not goodness? And what is the difference in your view between goodness, which is let's say op because opposite to evil? I don't know if it's love. I would say it's goodness. Thank you. Can I respond? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for all of the really, really thoughtful contributions. I guess what I want to say is, well, first of all, I, I don't think this is science fiction or fantasy. And I think there are communities around the world that have used love at the core of decision making. And one, one community with which I'm familiar is the Maori community in New Zealand, which is an indigenous community. And this is, this is not to romanticize that community, but aroha, the idea of aroha, sometimes translated as love or hospitality, is one of the values that has been at the core of decision making amongst Maori communities. So I, the first thing I'd say is I, I don't think it's impossible for love to be at least one lodestar or touchstone for our decision making. The second thing I want to say is that love is different from all of these other values that we've talked about. And that's why I think love can't be collapsed into any of these values. And I think you acknowledge this when you say these other values are milder or perhaps more realistic. So I think when we talk about empathy, we're talking about understanding the position of another. But love is more active. Love requires action. When we talk about goodness, to me that is a much more generalized concept, which is actually much harder to pin down. Whereas love, to me a deep sense of warmth directed towards another, can be narrower and sharper. Solidarity and fraternity, I think, are related to love as well. Uh, but again, I think they're about identifying with the position of another and expressing support for the position of another. And I think they're different from love. And so I think part of the project of love, if I can call it that, is sharpening our idea of what love is so that we can say it's meaningfully different from these concepts, but also maybe more powerful than these concepts. And then that raises the question, well, is it dangerous in its power, which, which you rightly raised? And to that, I'd partly say what, what I said earlier, which is I don't think we should be scared of emotions in politics because I think emotions are inescapable in politics. But I do think we have to make judgments about which emotions we let into our political discussions and which we keep out. To me, love can be misused, as it has been by the Austrian Freedom Party, but we should remember that traditional ideals like freedom and equality have also been interpreted in very different ways and misused. And what we've done over time is try to build up sharper definitions so that we can trade arguments about what the best vision of freedom, equality, or love is. I guess the last thing I'd say in response to the really interesting things that Thomas said about love and trade and whether love is strong enough, and I know I haven't responded to all of the points about the different shades and grades of love, but maybe we can come back to, to those points, is I think there are some interesting parallels between love and trade, and maybe you're alluding to this. Yeah. I mean, both love and trade are about relationships. And actually, love, I think, is also about difference. And Thomas was saying, uh, one of the beautiful things about trade is it involves benefiting from difference. And to me, the picture of love that I have in my head, and I think that's one of the virtues of love, is we all have a picture of it in our head. That's why it can be real, is that it involves creating an equilibrium between quite different people and finding a way forward through difference. This is not about love of country, it's about love of others, and it's not about love of just our in-group, but it's about a deep sense of warmth directed towards as expansive a group as possible. It's a civic love, which might be different from intense private love, but I think it's a love that is strong enough to, the be, to be the base for at least some fresh political discussion. Tomáš, přímá reakce? Would you like to respond? That's the topic of the day because that's what I feel we are getting, that we're exaggerating our love, we're exaggerating our hospitality, we are exaggerating our solidarity and charity. Maybe this is what's happening in, in the world of politics. If you ask Aristotle, he would say yes. I mean, love can be exaggerated because Aristotle was famously known for uh, for pointing out that if you, if you take the most holy thing and you exaggerate it, it becomes malice. Huh? Um, and but a other great thinker, Jesus, Jesus. It's also funny that he doesn't appear in the history of philosophy. 
interestingly, <laughs> says no, love cannot be exaggerated. You can't, and, 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 and I happen to, I mean, there is n nothing wrong has really happened in history when we've overdone our love. Or maybe one or two excesses compared to 10,000 where there was a lack of love. Seeing, seeing the audience here today, maybe, maybe I would like to put in another aspect, which is the whole idea of emotions. Hmm? Because that's also something with which we work. And very often we say that, I apologize to you, I wasn't myself, I was too emotional. So we believe, in common language, we have this notion that emotions are dangerous, flickery, unstable. And even in, say, in Czech Republic, we say, uh, emoce, emoce, pak jsou z toho nemoce. Uh, too much emotions makes you sick, yeah, or it turns your belly up well, sooner or later. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman very, very sharply and very, very brutally uh, in, his, uh, in, in his book about Holocaust pointed out that maybe the most serious sins are not sins of rationality, uh, sorry, not sins of emotion. Sorry, I wasn't myself, I was drunk or I was moody, I wasn't, you know, I was emotional. Somebody made me upset, so that's why I'm angry at, at you as well. I wasn't rational. But Bauman says that the most, the biggest sins that happened in mankind were in fact sins of rationality, where emotions were lacking. And this is how he, of course, interprets the Holocaust. In Zygmunt Bauman's reading, Holocaust was not an oops of modernity, which, you know, how could an educated and cultured and so technically advanced nation, or Europe rather, do that? But it is exactly a direct result of modernity, Bauman says. It is exactly being efficient to the, to the, to the, to the barest degree without feeling compassion. Which is interestingly, by the way, here as an economist, trying to uh, sort of cleanse the, uh, the, the, the bad name of economics, this was one of the main philosophical additions that Adam Smith had. His moral theory, um, uh, theory of moral sentiments was based exactly that we have, like we have smell, taste, and, and uh, touch, that we, he believed that we also have this sort of lo, uh, uh, sympathy or empathy compass. And he says, if, if, if somebody is doing something to a small child in a fictional story, it makes you feel bad even though you have no utility um, in that child's prosperity or not. This is where he goes way beyond uh, to which economics has shrunk. So uh, just, 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 just that. And I really don't think that love looks for differences as much, much as economic. I mean, it was, this would be an interesting, maybe cooking, but also for some, okay, for example, I like to taste different kitchens from different countries, but from comparing myself to my friends, I'm like the only, I'm, I'm like the very few. Most of my friends like eating what they've been eating since they've been, they've been 16. I wonder whether art looks for differences as much as economics. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it's, it's really debatable uh, and I'm happy to enter this debate. So I would suggest that we build this planet on weak love, solidarity, uh, and not passionate love, but this weak love which could be uh, brought about by, by, by people trading with each other. And it's, it's to me, it's, it, it is the, str it's, it's, you can build on this and then you can love or hate. Um, yeah. And, and cooking is a good idea because that usually is, is for the first time when people to see into different culture, eating a Turkish dish is for, uh, for many people the first window of otherness. Padli tu, we are discussing what love may mean, what everything, what different things love may mean. And there was also a direct question to Max, and that is, isn't it better to speak about solidarity or other feelings which create this relationship to other people? And there was a good note about the excessive use of the word by in some very sensitive context, Slavenka mentioned nationalism in this context. So I have a question to Philip. What do you think of this excessive use of the word love? Or it's very practical 
propagandistic use in policy, nationalism in politics, and the con maybe also in the context of the current political situation in Austria. The voting has been done, so, and um, I, I maybe I want to be more, you know, maybe uh, argue on a more fundamental level, but anyway, thanks for the question. And, you know, this, we have talked now a little bit about the excesses of love and and can it be exaggerated? I would say no. However, you know, talk to a divorce lawyer and, and you see how the emotion of love uh, can turn into hate. Um, you know, sometimes there's dialectics in life, unfortunately. So, and at least in maybe to also convey a picture of, of the Central European culture. There is this saying in Polish, uh, that means every good deed will be punished accordingly. Um, this also exists in Russian, so it's not only Central European. Um, but anyway, I think there's something to it in the sense that if indeed, you know, one is confronted with a personality like Jesus Christ, right? Um, that also can infuse to the person who is confronted with, you know, um, you know, such a superhuman being, you know, who is so lovingly and so gracious, and uh, that can infuse a feeling of inferiority and even, you know, uh, result in aggression or in the, you know, the punishment, the exploitation, and finally even the punishment of the one who does the good deed. So this is maybe the skepticism which is in, built in our culture. But anyway, I started with the divorce lawyer uh, because you know how quickly that can turn into love can turn into a nightmare. Um, um, but anyway, let's come back to the original point I'm trying to make in the statement, which is um, less skeptical. Okay, especially in social media, but also in public, we have this in, you know hate speech. Um, well, it has become a public political issue, like Trump and other people, you know, the hate speech has indeed become popular and you can win elections with it. That means you win a majority. And in the social media, it's even worse. I, I did that, I did a small study with, with a friend from Budapest, actually, in his, his company. They do big data research and, you know, and there's uh, how are narratives framed and nowadays, I, I'm coming back to the example of refugees. Okay, very often the word refugee is framed uh, with hate, okay, and this rejection. So that's very clear. And since this is happening in uh, in very short statements and anonymous, I still think okay, one should have a counter narrative. And actually, you gave the example how the counter narrative works. You showed us the picture of war. Okay, 60 or maybe 80 years ago, a picture of war was connected and there was a narrative framing that this was an heroic act to kill other people. The picture you have shown us uh, shows our still dominant narrative framing. That's why people react so much on this picture that nowadays war we consider it as something evil and cruel. So the narrative framing of war has changed, right? It's, it's not seen as something good anymore, but it's something bad. Um, and that's why I react to this picture. Um, and we sympathize with the vanquished. And so maybe indeed one needs to counter, you know, all these hate um, speeches in the social media particularly, and on Twitter and all these, you know, new modes of communication um, with a, it needs to counter it um, with a different message. However, still, I'm, I'm still I remain somewhat skeptical because if you want to counter hate, one can also have a completely different argument, which is not you know the dialectics to put it in a in a dialectic and say okay here's hate and we counter it with love. But uh, coming back to your argument, Tomas. Um, one can also counter it with a very utilitarian argument. Hate doesn't pay off. It's uneconomic. Um, and it will create material loss. 
And nationalism, I think Europeans are still aware that nationalism also creates material loss. I mean, um, still Hungarians don't feel it so much, how this economic nationalism of Orban creates material loss, but they will feel it in the future. Um, and some of them feel it already now, and um, you know, every, um, well, I don't want to speak too long, but if you meet nowadays uh, Hungarian uh, Slovaks, quite often they uh, pertain positively to Slovakia. Why? Because they have already noticed that their material, you know, um, they're rather better off than their neighbors in northern Hungary, okay? So, um, so there's also, you know, this ut utilitarian argument against nationalism, against hate, um, and maybe that uh, can also be uh, taken, taken up. So that, that's maybe one, one reaction on our, our discussion. So not to, you know, of course I sympathize because I think to counter the message of hate, okay, it, it's very useful to think about the message of love, to change the narrative framing. Um, so, for example, concerning refugees, okay? Um, even, the, even the worst, you know, Freedom Party support in Austria, usually, if you encounter him and you talk with him and he will say, um, you know, and he starts to yell at you and you appeal and say, come on, don't lose the courtesy, you want to be höflich, right? Then the Austrian will stand up and say, oh, sure, I, will, I want to be höflich, right? And, and um, he will try to straighten up and uh, show some courtesy. Um, if you appeal to him and say, come on, you know, with your hate speech and you say, mm, uh, um, why are you so ungastlich, right? Um, hospitality, it would still be, you know, something positively connotated. So, you know, there's various ways to counter the hate message with variations of love. But however, there's also the utilitarian argument. And now the question is, um, is that mutually exclusive, the normativism and the utilitarianism? What would you think? Or can one combine it? If so, how? <laughs> Could Max very quickly respond? And then Slavenka wanted to enter to join the discussion. Oh, just briefly, I just want to park the point that I, I'm not sure that love is the opposite of hate. And, and maybe that's something we could talk about further later. But um, is love the best way of countering these movements of hate? Where I completely agree with you is we're only going to counter movements and push people into action by appealing to values as well as evidence. And we know from research that this is what moves people. So a group called Common Cause did research on climate change, which showed that appealing to facts didn't really move people into action on climate change. In fact, often appealing to facts, and this is exactly what you're saying, just led to people um, freezing up in their own positions and holding on to their positions even harder. And what's needed is an appeal to values as well as facts. And the question is, yeah, which values need to be invoked alongside facts or evidence? I think love might be one of those. Um, I don't think love is the only value we need in politics when I talk about a politics of love but I do think it might have some hope. And the last thing I'd say is, um, I don't think um, my view of politics is inconsistent with using some consequentialist or utilitarian or um, uh, arguments like that. Um, and I, I, I'd be open to those if, if they'd help to counter hate. Ďakujem. Poprosím Slavenku Drakulič o reakciu na to, čo hovoril. Could now Slavenka respond to Filip? Um, but I also think so, Tomas, but it's not so much about response. I just, I mean, I hate myself for pulling you down all the time, but uh, it's, uh, I'm a storyteller, so I tell you one little example. Um, you said um, hate doesn't pay off. Unfortunately, this is a rational peak of people speaking. Every Russian person will say hate is expensive, it destroys, it's destruction, it doesn't pay off. Yes, but it doesn't work like that. And this is why I'm all the time talking about emotions. Namely, what happened? Before the war in uh, Yugoslavia started, we had the Prime Minister called Ante Markovic. He was in the second half of the 80s Prime Minister, and he decided that he will make, uh, after a big inflation, he will make um, 
um, uh, um, dinner convertible. Yeah. So then it was the time of uh, it was a good time because people, for example, could go could go to the bank, change it for Deutsche Marks, and this is the time when most of the people in Yugoslavia bought their last. TV, last vacuum cleaner, that is the new TV, new vacuum cleaner, new television, new, the, I already said that, new fridge, uh, appliances, new cars, because it was then possible. This was, however, the time of Milosevic. Nationalism was going very, very uh, high and hot. It was in the air. And when they asked Markovic, they said, okay, I mean, uh, don't you see what is happening? And he's, uh, he said almost directly, almost uh, uh, verbatim this, uh, hate doesn't pay off, nationalism doesn't pay off. Nothing will happen because when people see that they have money, that they can buy things with money, that they have good life, they are not going to go to war. Uh, you know, it didn't last uh, maybe a couple of years, and they were at war. So rationalism uh, spe speaks for, uh, uh, you know, it's utilitarism, but from the rationalist point of view. And it doesn't really always uh, end like that. Sorry. Tomáš? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to come back to your your picture because there it's 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 very strong and and uh, and something that I was actually thought of right right now as I was listening to you. I was for a long time I was thinking that nothing comes clear. Even if you take the most beautiful examples of love and I again let's go we can go anywhere. We can go to Romer and Juliet. We can go to but let's go to theology again. Even in in Christian and uh, and Hebrew tradition, if you read God's relationship to human beings, if he I always say that if God had a Facebook, his relationship to human beings would be under the status it's complicated, you know, it's not like, yes. And if you read the Bible with a little bit of, you know, without the sort of the fanatical um, eye eyeglasses, it's, it's extremely love-hate, it's bipolar, even the divinity as our biggest imagination of goodness is unable to constantly love. He, he praises the Jewish people, then he kills half of them, and then it's good again, and then sometimes he loves the religious leaders, sometimes he mocks them. So nothing comes clear, nothing comes clean. If you think about two opposite words, desire and fear, for example, you, and if you think about it for a little while, you will see that desire is not, there is a little bit of, there is little bit of, uh, of fear in desire. This is the typical falling in love when you are 16, this happens to you for the first time. Of course, the strongest emotion is love, but there is a huge component of fear. And also, there is a little bit of desire in fear. This is why we much watch horror movies. This is why we watch tragedies. This is why we make movies called Star Wars and we don't make movies called Star Peace. Because it would be very difficult to have seven sequels to something called Star Peace and love and, and, and happiness and party, party, party. Huh? Um, so, 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 and even romantic, uh, even, even like, you know, things made, even Bollywood which is full of love and dancing, is structured around a certain problem. There is some stress in it. If you, if you read the story of, let's go in, into, into other fantasy, if you know anybody who has richer fantasy than Tolkien, please tell me. But even Tolkien could not fantasize a region of peace. So if you look in, if you, if you analyze Middle Earth, the most what, uh, most favorite country to live would be Rivendell. Huh? That's, where, that's where the elves live. But even in Rivendell, elves are not very happy. They're constantly wanting to move west, which for us from Central Europe is understandable. <laughs> but it, what my point is, in the whole trilogy of the Fellowship of the Ring, or the Lord of the Rings, you will not find a description of a peaceful land where people just had as the name of this panel, party of love. But it's imaginable that you have party of love. Very difficult to imagine a party of hate. So my point is, again, I will, I will stop here. And this is the huge difference between love and evil, between good and bad. By the way, good is not the opposite of evil. Good is a subset of evil. Your, do you know that your stomach doesn't hurt? Of course not. 
You will only know this after it hurts for two days and then it stops. You will have these maybe half an hour of, oh my God, it feels so good when my stomach, teeth, eyes. There are about thousands of things that can hurt in your body. You don't realize that they don't hurt until they actually do hurt for a little while and then the pain goes away. So, so goodness has conversion, uh, it, it converges to something, it is a stable um, prolongation. Evil does not converge to anything. There is no such thing as party of, 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 of evil, party of hate. Nobody would come to a party of, 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 of hate. Uh, and that's what makes goodness superior under any definition over bad, and that's what makes love superior and workable. You can build things on love, and they won't be perfect, they will flicker in that. But you can't really build anything on hate. It simply doesn't have, it's not gravitational enough. And even evil things you do because you want to end, you want to get something good. So if I murder you out of revenge, or, you know, I would never do that. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you don't know until it happens, huh? Um, you will, you will, uh, I do it not for the hate, but because I want to get justice, for example, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, we didn't want to go into this debate, but love and hate are not on the same level. It's, it's not like one and minus one. Ďakujem pekne Tomášovi Sedlačkovi. Uh, v tejto chvíli uh, ja si po krátkom pohľade na hodinu... Thank you. Uh, having a short look at the watch, I have to uh, stop this uh, discussion of the panelists, but looking at the audience, I see there are some people who would like to ask a question. Uh, it seems that there is no mobile mic downstairs, but if uh, there is no mic, I'll just ask your question and I'll repeat it or... Okay, the microphone is there. I wanted to ask your opinion concerning my speculation, um, because um, It is or it consists in the idea that hatred seems to be an easier emotion than doing good. If we are people who have an opportunity to travel throughout the world, who give lectures, are paid for them, have no financial worries, have good prospects, then love is an easy emotion. I love the world, I like to do good, and I enjoy solidarity of various kinds. But if I am a person and who cannot offer anything of this, for whom the market is very similar, um, or he is, he has the similar position on the market as uh, scores of other people. Uh, so um, I think hatred is something that will save my resources, uh, because if I am feel to be abused, uh, tired, exploited, I am part of a an indifferent mass of people, then doing good is uh, too demanding on me, but hatred saves my time and is a source of relax for me. So what would you say to this? I would like to respond to this um, question. Okay, I'll answer in Czech. Uh, you know Zimmerman, who is uh, he is a Czech uh, uh, comic who said that the shortcut is um, uh, uh, an easier one, but less uh, but less pleasant. Hate and love are hard; can be hard. And the first thing I'd say is, um, I do think. Uh, Hate has been an easier emotion to reach for at different points in history. And there's research backing this up, say, in the area of um, criminal justice, which is an area I'm interested in. Um, so, yeah, some academics uh, in the UK have shown that uh, revenge as a way of understanding justice 
uh, has kind of waxed and waned over time, uh, and that there hasn't been a kind of steady way of, of um, approaching justice as revenge. The way that connects to your question is I, I think um, politicians and other people in society can create conditions where hate is easier or harder. Um, I also think in relation to love that love is hard, that love takes work and that's why I want to get away from this kind of like fluffy idea of love and just calling on everyone to love each other. I, I don't think love is easy at all. Um, and I agree with you that sometimes uh, people without resources, different kinds of resources, including economic resources, um, may find it harder uh, to love. At the same time, in, in my experience with people in a range of life circumstances, I think it's extraordinary how people find the capacity for love, even in the most desperate of situations. So. Just to summarize that, uh, in short, uh, I think at the moment, hate is an easier emotion to reach to for love than, than love, but I don't think that is inevitable. Uh, and I think we could, if we wanted, to try to create conditions where love is, is not so hard, but it will remain an achievement. Because the question was too good to make just a you know, witty joke uh, over it. Um, this idea of either uh, evil, you said that evil as a shortcut, that I think is a, uh, to that my joke I think applies, but evil as a form of relaxing, I think that I congratulate you on that idea. That's I think is, that's a great way of looking at it. Um, because I think one of what we are experiencing, or one way how to read what's happening is that we are tired of being the good guy without really being the good guy. But there is this, there is this tiredness in, in Czech. I translate it as um, you know, according to the famous, famous movie. And also they call us the sunny people. So it's a little bit being tired of the, of the sunny people. I've been just developing this theory with an Austrian friend of mine, Oliver Tanzer, when we were writing about Lilith, that people feel all kinds of oppression. And the, common, the most common form of oppression is from up down. Yeah? I want to stand straight, but something is oppressing me. So I was playing around a little bit with the direction of oppression. And there are many ways uh, in which I could also oppress you sideways. Yeah, I want to go straight with something. The most interesting direction of oppression that nobody speaks about, but I think is the most common one, is an oppression from below. And that is really the oppression that I feel. I want, there is no oppression from being a better guy. You want to go give all your money to charity and start your own bio farm. You don't even need to use banks. You don't need to use money. You don't need to use electricity. You can live a perfectly Amish life. There is no barrier upwards. There is no oppression from above. There is huge oppression from below because sometimes I feel like raping and I can't because there will be legal consequences. Sometimes I feel like slapping somebody's face in the id before I censor it with culture. And so maybe this is the feeling that we are feeling. We are sick and tired, the population says, we don't want to be this good. We're, we want to be a little bit racist. We want to be a little bit sexist. This is, this is what they call, I think, or what we call political correctness. I want to be a little bit racist, but there is this oppression from below. I can't. They're pushing me. The society is pushing me upwards. So I think that this evil as, as a recharge, I think that's a great idea and, and, and should, be, should be developed because it does, even in my personal life, You're working, you're studying, you're writing, and then in your break, you put something like America's Got Talent, which isn't evil, but on the scale of things, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am not sure who was the first person to ask, so for this gentleman. I have a question to Mr. Sedlacek, a difficult one, to be good. If I expect that I will get a reward, that's good to be good then. But there is a large group of atheists who don't believe that they will be rewarded for doing good. And they also know that there is not enough to prove in the world that this is your reward. They will be not good. They will do what is worth to do. Can that be changed? Well, let's read these Milgram experiments from a positive way. If it's so easy to make normal people, to make people evil, 
just by defining institutions around them, we should maybe also... So, to be brutally frank, my belief is not in, um, in uh, changing person. My belief in is changing institutions so that love becomes... or goodness becomes cheap. Stupid example, and I call this moral exoskeleton. My thesis is, which I will not develop, of course, here today, is that you are more everywhere else than inside of your bag of skin. That you are more represented in the institutions and in the movie culture, and your desires are basically made up by movies that we've been watching since our childhood. Your desires and my desires are not my own. Um, and so also is not my work. My work, somebody else gives me work and somebody else gives me desires. But I do believe in the cheapness of, of good and evil. So if good would be expensive, yeah. But if good, if good would be cheap, then there is hope. So if I, let's, let's imagine I, I walk the street and I see a small little baby lying on the, on the, on the pavement. I will not have a moral dilemma what to do with that baby. The, the, the peak of morality is to not have morality. To, I will have no moral, moral dilemma whether to kick the baby or whether to call, call, call 112. I will call 112. Why? Because it's cheap for me. If 200 years ago, same situation, this is the Victor Hugo, Les Miserables situation, I find uh, a baby on the street, I would have to take care of it for two months and, and, and maybe it will cost me a lot of money before I give it to somebody else to take care of it. So in a nation, in Slovakia, you have already built a moral exoskeleton which you activate by pressing a button on your cell phone and institutions take care of it automatically. That's why it's an automaton. Ironically, even today, if I wanted to take care of that baby myself without institutions, I'm not allowed to do that, which is okay, which is the way it's supposed to be. Institution, that's why I say you are more in the institutions than you are inside of you. I can't, for example, even find source of fresh water. So my drinking is more outside than inside. So, so all these Milgram experiments could also be reversed. And if we forge a society in the way that and institutions are not automatic and institutions are not God-given. Institutions are our responsibility. And we are fully responsible of our institutions and what institutions do. Last, last comment from Hunger Games. I don't know if you've seen the last part. The advantage of my job is to watch stupid movies like that and, and I'm working. In the last Hunger Games, uh, they changed the rules a little bit. The rule normally is only one survives. So there was this female and male and they were hunting each other, of course, trying to kill each other. And then the game got a little bit boring, so the ones who were inventing the rules said, no, 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 two can now survive. So they immediately, they even fell in love, actually, in, as it happens in movies. Yeah? Uh, and they suddenly started cooperating, and the only change of rule was not one wins, but two wins. And that immediately would affect your behavior and my behavior. So there is hope for mankind, not in bettering oneself, but in changing institutions that make your living and subsistence in it, in it um, uh, smooth. Thank you very much. Philip, and then... It relates to what uh, Tamar said now, and this is uh, that, uh, about Milgram experiment. I mean, Milgram experiment and Stanford experiment, in my opinion, shouldn't be just brush over or anything. I know it wasn't your intention. It was just an example. It's not about how people soon become, quickly become uh, evil or whatever. It is about the force of circumstances. And the uh, force of circumstances is such, that's my, again, ex uh, experience and what I wrote about. I wrote a book, uh, a book about uh, war criminals just to show the force of circumstances. It is such that I, after being into that research, I as a person cannot guarantee what I would have done in the same circumstances. So it's not predictable. So, I mean, it should be taken a little bit uh, with that in mind when we are speaking about this kind of experiment. That's all. Thank you very much, Philip. And then the last question. Um, I really like those two questions. Um, however, I think they put, and now our discussion puts uh, maybe, you know, emotions and also love or hate more on a uh, individual level. And I would, you know, of course there's the joy of the little sin, right? Uh, the stolen cherry always tastes nicer than the, than the bought cherry. 
that, that, that's clear. Um, nevertheless, you know, when we think about uh, the material resources, you know, for love and hate, I mean, it is an old argument of, sorry, I have to use the term of the bourgeoisie, um, that the poor are prone to do more evil than the ones who are rich. Uh, but I think one can also turn it around. I mean, why do the rich remain rich? Because they keep their money. Hmm? Um, and so I'm not so sure about the distribution of morality according to material or, you know, money status, upper and lower society. I, I don't believe in it, but I want to pertain to um, a more systemic problem. And that is, um, okay, the individual reacts, you know, with the little sin and all that. Um, okay, the individual might also, you know, want to be a little, you know, to be skeptical of foreigners and, you know, show some, you know, some small-scale nationalism and all that. But I, I think we are facing a, in terms of hate or uh, other, you know, a new phenomenon in, in present-day democracies, I think we are facing a systemic problem, which is uh, democracies have become demographic. Okay, so it's opinion polls, opinion research, and of course you will discover that, let's say, 60, 70, 80 percent of the population are skeptical of foreigners and are afraid of maybe refugees, okay? Even in Germany, which tries to put it itself up as a moral example, at least the governing person, uh, Ms. Merkel. Um, and, okay, so you see the opinion polls that, uh, okay, uh, the majority is fairly nationalistic, fairly xenophobic, um, and now, according to this new mode of, you know, working out uh, the, the democracy, how it's functioning, then, of course, you know, the ruling politicians very often, they take those negative emotions, the hate, the, the nationalism, as a point of departure for their own policy. And then they reinforce it, you know, playing with this nationalism and then reinforcing, even strengthening the nationalism which has been there before. Maybe this was also the problem in, you know, with this Markovich Milosevic uh, uh, conflict, and that's what I'm really um, afraid of, that you have this transmission of mediocrity, nationalism through opinion polls, through politics, and then politics reinforcing in this pseudo-democratic uh, thing, in this, you know, uh, demographic um, mode of, of, of running a democracy, and then reinforcing the negative messages, the negative narrative framing and the hate. Um, and that's what I'm really afraid of, that in this way, uh, we maybe, you know, we live in different times than before. That's what I say as a historian. That was also to, pertaining to the second question, indirect. Thank you very much. Now the last question. Um, I felt that you talked a lot about love, which I think we can agree it's an emotion. And you talk about it in very rational way, which I think was also a problem of Slavinka. And I want to ask uh, if it's an emotion, and I will buy into your arg argument we should bring this emotion into politics. Um, can we bring an emotion in a rational way? Because how otherwise do you want to uh, stimulate love? We usually don't decide to fall in love, at least in my own experience. It's not a <laughs> rational decision. <laughs> yeah, that's why we call we fall in love. So my question is, even if we would like your argument about changing and bringing into politics love, how do we do it uh, if we might not be able to do it rationally? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, thanks for asking the question. And also, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for speaking in English for, for my uh, benefit and, and sorry um, uh, about speaking English. But... Um, I guess what I would say is um, I think we have to talk about love in both rational and emotional ways. And in some other writing that I've done, I've tried to speak about love perhaps in a less rationalistic way. So I've, I've tried to write about in my personal life, in my personal experience, how I've felt love. Um, yeah, for example, in my book, I, I sort of touch on this indirectly, but um, Three years ago, I suddenly had a, a heart condition brought to my attention, and I had to go through open heart surgery. And 
the overwhelming feeling that I had in um, the healthcare that I got and the care that I got from, from my friends was that of love. And I think that sparked some of my thinking about this. And I think that's a less rationalistic way of describing my interest in love and the importance of love. And I guess the last thing I'd say is um, I do think one way to talk about this that isn't rationalistic is to um, talk in terms of stories. Because I think we know that stories move people and stories are not um, cold or rationalistic. And to add to that, I think we should think about creative forms of expression, music, art, um, other forms of creativity. I think there's a lot of uh, evidence there of the power of love, and I think we can use that to strengthen the case for a politics of love. That's only a partial answer to a really good question, but I hope that starts to answer it. Thank you very much. We here on the stage would like to thank you who took part in our discussion and who asked questions. Thank you very much. And I would also like to thank Max Harris, Filip Ter, Slavenka Draculic and Tomasz Sedlacek for being with us and discussing here with us. Thank you so much. And we will continue in the Central European Forum in a while with the following panel.